Hi, I'm Ron, and I'm doing a presentation on American Rodeo, men versus women, and where do African Americans fit in? So, um, rodeo in America is such an adrenaline rush. Um, the crowd filled stands, um, the rodeo clowns, the unpredictable bulls, and the uh, contestants who are just making it one entry fee at a time. So the sport consists of a lot of traveling, um, a lot of disappointments, um, uh, practice and money, but every pro athlete in rodeo has one goal in mind, and that is to make it to the National Finals Rodeo, also known as the NFR, and that consists of 10 days at the um, Thomas and Mack Center. And so the professional rodeo and NFR consists of eight events, and that consists of bull riding, bronc riding, saddle on bareback, um, team roping, steer wrestling, tie down roping, barrel racing, and newly added breakaway roping. Um, so to make it into the NFR in, the eight, in any of these events, you must be in the top 15 in the world standings. Um, out of all the events, women only participate in veil racing and breakaway roping. So the men have six events to themselves. Um, so the question is, why such, the, why such a division? Um, and do men have an advantage in rodeo? And although the NFR has been noticing more and more African Americans in rodeo, um, is this due to um, African Americans getting more exposure to rodeo now in such a white dominated environment? So rodeo history and men in the sport. Um, rodeo is said to have began in 1869 when two groups of cowboys um, from neighboring ranches met in Deer Trail, Colorado, um, mentioned by the PRCA. Um, the cowboys wanted to settle an argument of who um, was best at doing everyday um, cowboy stuff. <laughs> so um, they started breaking wild horses to ride um, for ranch, uh, ranch work and whoever did it the fastest won. Um, and eventually this actually um, translated into today's event, um, bronc riding. So in um, 1936, the first National Cowboys uh, Organization finally emerged. It was called um, the Cowboys Turtle Association and later became the Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association, also known as the PRCA. And then in 1975, it's still named that, um, it is still named that to, uh, to this day. And then in eight, 1975, um, uh, pro rodeo struggled for like many years um, with better prize money and judges who understood the sport. Um, but the PRCA has experienced um, tremendous growth um, and that in terms of membership, national exposure, media coverage, um, and sanctioned rodeos. Um, in 2013, so, the prices have gone up since then. Um, $39.6 million was paid out in prize money um, to the PRCA rodeos. Um, and a great improvement from the 1900s, but women still had it much harder than men. So women's rodeo history. Um, women didn't have an association until 1948, um, mentioned from Bleeker. Um, it started um, with a group of women who um, from Texas who wanted to join in the rodeo lifestyle. So um, 38 women traveled to um, San Angelo, Texas on February 28, 1948. And um, they went to um, uh, kind of argue about the way that they were um, being treated in such the male dominated sport. Um, <clears throat> So together they were able to create the very first professional sport association created solely for women um, called the Girls Rodeo Association, which they called the GRA. Um, the GRA quickly began to draft and approve rules so that um, they can announce world championship titles. And they also um, <clears throat> made a um, alliance with the PRCA so that they could do um, rodeos together, combine them, do events, um, male and female. Um, so the GRA um, changed their name to the WPRA, which is known as the Women's Pro Rodeo Association, um, and that's what it's called today. Um, the WPRA consisted of the same events as the males, so women were actually 
stepping up their game and doing, you know, rough and tough stuff. Um, so the only events that were different were barrel racing and breakaway roping, which I will touch up on. So we'll start off with barrel racing. So barrel racing is a timed event. There's three barrels. Um, it's in a set in a clover leaf pattern. Um, there's all different types of sizes, but the one main size that everybody's known uh, that everybody knows um, is it's called a standard pattern. So it is 90 feet from the first and second barrel, and it is 120 feet from first to third and second to third. Um, so barrel racing, um, you can actually take part in this in a 4D men can take part in this in a 4D open barrel race and a jackpot, but they cannot participate in rodeo. And that is specifically because it is a WPRA event and you can go to any other ro rodeo organization and you will not find men participating in barrel racing. Um, in earlier NFRs, barrel racing was not held in conjunction with the rest of the NFR events. Um, and it was just located at a different location. Um, to protest, the um, WPRA held their finals in Fort Worth, Texas, and so they totally excluded themselves from the PRCA. Um, so the PRCA, um, they struggled, and eventually they actually asked in 1967 if the women um, barrel racers could actually come to the NFR and compete with the rest of the events. Um, so they decided to include it, and they would have $1,000 in prize money. Um, and then it became official in 1968, um, and the purse um, rose to 2,500, according to Bleeker. And then, um, even though barrel racing was finally um, incorporated into rodeo, there was a um, big pay gap. So um, <clears throat> barrel racing was not paid the same as the rest of the men's events, and to this is crazy to me. Um, they didn't start paying them the same amount as the rest of the men's events until 1998. Um, so <clears throat> this pay gap was acceptable for many, many years. Um, but um, with that being said, um, there was another event added in 2020, and that was breakaway roping. So um, what breakaway roping is, is there is a horse and rider, it's called a box, they stand in the corner, there is a calf in the um, chute, and there is a rope that is connected from the chute from the box. So once that uh, calf goes from the chute, the barrier is broken and the horse and rider can then go ahead and proceed to rope the calf. Once they rope the calf, they can dally and the rope actually breaks away from the calf once that row breaks away from the calf, the time is stopped. Um, so, uh, for the first time ever, women competed for the first ever world championship. It was called the Wrangler National Finals Breakaway Roping, also known as the NFBR, in 2020. Um, the event only lasted for three days rather than the 10 consecutive days. Um, but they had a purse of $200,000, so that's pretty good for three days. Um, the NFBR was also a separated ticketed, ticketed event. Also, it was shown earlier than the rest of the NFR events. So unfortunately, um, the girls were at the same arena. Um, they were able to get a world title, but um, they were not able to celebrate in that same glory of having you know, all the fans in, this, you know, in the stands, um, that same energy vibe. Um, and they were also televised at a completely different time as well. Um, but as for African Americans, their story was a little bit different than women. If anything, they had an easier time coming into rodeo than women did. Um, so I will start off with a couple people um, that really stand out in the rodeo um, scene. So the first I'm going to talk about is Bertus Degnan. He was the first African American to make it into the NFR in 1964, according to um, the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. And in 1967 and 68, he finished third and fourth in the, the world standings for bull riding. And then um, later, he finished seventh overall in 1972, and that was his last NFR um, appearance. 
Next is Fred Whitfield. He's one of the most well-known um, African Americans in rodeo. Um, he has he shares a lot of titles. So um, he recently just retired in 2018, but he holds seven uh, world championships in tie down roping, and he also holds um, second. He's also the second black cowboy to win an NFR World Championship. The first black cowboy in the PRCA to win the all-around NFR title, where he competed in three events, which were tie-down roping, steer wrestling, team roping, in 1999, according to Jurax. And then just two years prior, in 1997, he set the NFR record um, by roping 10 cows over the 10-day event, with an average of 84 seconds. Um, Whitfield also won over $2 million, being the third person to do so in, um, in rodeo history. <clears throat> so, black contestants at the 2020 NFR. So, the first cowboy is Corey Solomon. This is him right here. Um, he was originally 16th overall in the world standings, but he actually got in um, to that 15th place spot because someone tested positive for COVID. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So he actually made it to the NFR and he had a great um, 10 days. He placed first in one of the rounds and placed in the other five. And um, so he actually jumped um, to third in the average for the NFR. And then um, for world standings, he jumped up to fifth. And then um, the next cowboy I'm going to talk about is Shad Mayfield. Um, he's biracial, so I can actually kind of, you know, um, relate to him in a way. Um, so he was actually, he had an $89,000 um, lead on the runner-up in world standings um, with 157156 for the 2020 season, um, according to the PRCA Sports News. And then, unfortunately, he did not have a great NFR. Um, he actually placed 15th overall in the average, so last. Um, but he still was able to get a world title. Um, finishing first because he was uh, he had so much money um, for the season. Um, African American women in rodeo. So to date, there has not been an African American woman in um, the NFR. Um, I'm in Ohio. I'm usually the only black person at a horse show or a rodeo. Um, I actually will see you know um, black men entered into the rodeo, which is pretty cool. Um, but if you go to Texas, you know, they're, I mean, they're just as dominant as, you know, um, Caucasians. But um, anyway, there are organizations that are trying their very best to get um, rodeo and other equestrian events out there. Um, I actually was able to participate in a project that was called Equestrians of Color. Um, so this is one of the pictures that was featured into um, the website. But um, anyway, so um, people of color from everywhere around the world were selected. I just happened to be lucky and got picked. Um, so we were able to do a kind of like um, a biography about ourselves, how we got into the sport that we were, you know, into, um, and tell everybody about our struggles that we've had being a minority um, in such a white dominated sport. Um, but it was such a good way to, um, you know, get ourselves out there and let everybody else, you know, um, aware of our situation. So what I think, um, from everything that I have gathered, um, I can conclude that um, rodeo is still pretty divided when it comes to women's events. Um, it wasn't long ago that barrel racing was included into the NFR. And not to mention, it wasn't until last year that breakaway um, roping was um, uh, brought into the NFR as well. So, um, but the WFPRA is doing its very best at um, uh, keeping rodeo alive for women, and it seems to be working little by little. Um, and it also can, can be concluded that African Americans are slowly on the rise as well when it comes to professional rodeo. Um, over the past couple years, states have organized, organized um, black rodeo groups, organizations, projects, and even a black national rodeo. Um, although the number of African American women participating in rodeo are much lower than males, um, this could be due to many factors, um, personal, location, um, 
status, money situation, or just a lack of information um, uh, to get involved into the sport. And here is my references. <laughs>